Hello guys, welcome. It's sheer honor today that we have invited a uh, distinguished guest, Mr. Nicholas Dux, to be on our show today. Hi, Mr. Nicholas, welcome to your talk show. Thank you very much. Good welcome to be to here with you. Yeah. Thank you. Could you first please, please introduce yourself a bit more to our audience? I'm Nicholas Dirks. I am a professor of history and anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley, where I was also the 10th chancellor. Wow. I'm in China uh, for two weeks at the Schwarzman College in Tsinghua University, where I'm a leader in residence. And uh, it's a very great opportunity to be back in Beijing and have this opportunity to, uh, to be on the Tsinghua campus for a couple of weeks. Mm, I know you have a really close relationship with the Tsinghua University here. Well, I've come to Tsinghua uh, on many occasions. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was chancellor of UC Berkeley, I was offered a honorary degree, which uh, was a very nice thing to get, a very uh, great honor. Yeah. Uh, and I also worked on various collaborations with colleagues here in Tsinghua, including, perhaps most importantly, something that is called the Tsinghua Berkeley Shenzhen Institute. Mm -hmm. What's is, that? As the name implies, it's in Shenzhen. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it's a joint institute that is focused on education and research in mm. three particular areas having to do with personalized or precision medicine, mm -hmm. with big data and data analytics, and with new materials. And uh, in, that, uh, in that context, not just materials for building, but also for technology, for batteries, for energy use, and so on and so forth. And it's uh, an, op an opportunity to bring together some of the finest researchers uh, from both Tsinghua mm -hmm. and UC Berkeley. Uh, let them work together uh, mm -hmm. and uh, have additional resources that have been made available by the Shenzhen municipality yeah. to set up laboratories, to set up uh, classrooms, to set up postdoctoral uh, opportunities and a joint PhD program. Wow, so it's, it's really a very meaningful international collaboration. No, yeah, it's a great collaboration. It's, yeah. uh, uh, it's something that Tsinghua felt very, uh, very committed to. Yeah. And I think it's part of uh, Tsinghua's global strategy to have yeah. collaborations of this kind. And it's uh, fun to be here in Schwarzman talking mm -hmm. about Shenzhen <laughs> because these are two of the most important international and global initiatives that Tsinghua has mm -hmm. undertaken. And uh, it's great to be part of both of them. Wow, great. As you also mentioned, you used to be the uh, chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley. Wow, that's, uh, that's quite an important and, and also uh, responsible position that you had. And can you tell us how did you make your way to becoming the chancellor there? Well, I uh, was, before going to Berkeley, uh, a professor at Columbia University in the city of New York. Uh, another prestigious university. Another great university. Yes. Uh, and while I was there, I was also the executive vice president and dean of the faculty. So mm -hmm. I was responsible for uh, six of the, uh, of, the f of the 16 schools uh, at Columbia. Wow. And uh, worked very closely with the president and with the other uh, EVP who uh, was in charge of the medical school and affiliated schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, together, uh, we did, I think, some great work. Uh, Columbia has always been a great university. Mm -hmm. But during the time I was EVP, we actually moved from being ranked uh, number nine to number three. Ah, oh, quite an achievement in, in the world. So uh, yeah. that was that was a great uh, a great time uh, yeah. to be at Columbia. And uh, and while I was at Columbia, I was able to do a number of things that were especially dear to me. One was uh, being part of building up some global centers around the world. Mm -hmm. One of which was here in Beijing. Oh, at that time. So uh, you, you, you back in 2008, we, uh, we set up a global center here. We set up a center also ago. in Mumbai. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was already involved in international things. But the, uh, but the invitation to come to Berkeley was on the basis of the work uh, we had done at Columbia. And uh, when I was invited to be the chancellor, it was a great, uh, great honor, too. And um, even though it meant moving across the country from New York City, where I'd lived for many years, to yeah, yeah. Uh, California, I, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, 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 I couldn't say no. Well, and also I'm sure the University of um, California had a hard time to let you go. Well, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I had a very intense period of time as the chancellor. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a lot done. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had some crises. Uh, we had some budgetary crises. Oh, uh, you mean in, in, in California? In, in California, California. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh -huh. Well, in California, because it's a public university, uh, Columbia is a private university, which means you have a different kind of funding basis. Okay. But uh, but you see, Berkeley depends upon money that comes from the state government. Uh huh. That's mm -hmm. to say, the state of California. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so when I went there, uh, uh, they had gotten uh, uh, they were dealing with some major cuts uh, that had come in the wake of. Uh, the Great Recession of 2008. Oh yeah, yeah. So the amount of state left. funding had had actually been reduced Decreased. by half. Half one. Now, That's a lot. When I went to California, uh, the economy of California, the state, was on the rebound. Uh huh. Uh, there was uh, a real sense that there was opportunity and possibility, but uh, the governor uh, was uninterested in uh, in in giving uh, us the money that we needed. Uh, uh, to make all of our ends meet. So it was a politically very interesting time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how and did you I had to put it off in the end? Well, in the end, uh, we had to gauge on a lot of cuts, uh, uh, which was not pleasant. And it was one of the reasons I decided I would necessary evil you move on do. and do something else. But <laughs> I, uh, we, got th we got the budget on, on track to be, uh, to be balanced and mm -hmm. uh, have been able to do the necessary economies. I see. But along the way, I, I had a lot of arguments with uh, Governor Jerry Brown. Wow. So that was an <laughs> interesting time in my life. Yeah, that was kind of like, um, I'm sure that must be one of many challenges you faced uh, as the chancellor. Well, yeah. you know, when you're a chancellor of the university, uh, you are in a position where you have to negotiate very hard for the institution you are trying to uh, steward and lead. and. Mm -hmm. uh, and the context, though, was uh, was a very charged uh, political context. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, even today, California has a surplus, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, but we keep saying that more money needs to go towards higher education. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you, I think you are in your opinion, you must agree that money spent on education is money well spent. Yeah. Uh, right? You know. Of course, it's my professional opinion. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the truth of the matter is that uh, that when you invest in uh, in a university, mm -hmm. it has immediate economic benefits for the region. Yeah. Arguably, the reason why the Silicon Valley is the Silicon Valley is because you have two great universities in the area. One is Stanford. Mm -hmm. The other is UC Berkeley. Yeah. Uh, we actually have uh, more graduates, uh, both undergraduates and uh, and graduate students, working in Silicon Valley even than Stanford, which wow. uh, has mm -hmm. obviously been very very critically involved in the uh, in the whole uh, development of uh, of the technology platforms that have made Silicon Valley synonymous with innovation, entrepreneurship, and yeah. uh, technological uh, wizardry of all yeah. kinds. The credit goes to Berkeley. <laughs> well, Berkeley played a big role. So, yes. so I was arguing that you know that this is good for the economy. And yeah, you invest, yeah. you'll get it back. You'll get it back yeah, in taxes, well and you'll spend, get it back yeah, in, uh, well in, in economic buoyancy. Yeah. But there's another reason to invest in the university. Uh, it has to do with the incredible students that you're able to educate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give them opportunities for uh, for exciting and uh, productive careers. Mm -hmm. uh, give them the benefit of learning about the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and doing so in a way that at Berkeley is so uh, meaningful because students come from many different backgrounds. Yep. A third of the Berkeley uh, undergraduate student body comes from families uh, that are making very little money, so they're from very low socioeconomic yeah. backgrounds. So it's a very uh, important uh, educational experience because it uh, actually proves that if you're uh, smart and willing to work hard, you mm -hmm. can actually uh, get yeah. ahead in life. Yeah. And then, by the same token, uh, the research work that Berkeley does is, uh, is, is beneficial not just to the state, but to the world. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We do work uh, uh, in, uh, in just about every area, across every field. Mm -hmm. uh, Berkeley's been known as a great comprehensive university. It's uh, mm -hmm. always been ranked high, but it has number one physics, number one chemistry, number one uh, uh, English, number one history, number one engineering. <laughs> so many uh, number ones. So many number ones. <laughs> there are many open courses from yeah. Berkeley. And yeah. that got By the so way, you should, you should, check, out you yeah, should yeah. check out a new one, which is just the been, one? Where is uh, it? it's on edX. It's ah. on the edX platform. Uh, it's called Data Science 8. Data 8 Science 8, okay. Yeah. Okay, guys, that? check that out. Check it out, because <laughs> it's a course that uh, while I was chancellor, we piloted. Uh, ah. It turned out that it was enormously popular. Mm -hmm. uh, we now have 3,000 undergraduate students taking this course, and it introduces them uh, not just to coding, but actually to how you think about analyzing big data. Uh -huh. And how you also 
can uh, 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 can take data from many different kinds of areas of life. Yeah, I see. Because it's everywhere, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's not just it's not just for uh, uh, for technology. It can be for uh, urban planning. It can be for uh, public health. Mm -hmm, uh, it mm -hmm. can be for tracking climate change. It can be for just about any purpose. Anything uh, yeah. with the data analysis, you can really help you make right decisions in many different well, you know, ways. It right? can, it's Even things. predict the future. Well, you can try with to. With data. You can <laughs> you try, try to. to yes. yeah. Predicting the future is not <laughs> always easy, and, uh, yeah. and there's a high failure rate. Yeah, yeah. But history sometimes repeats itself. Of but if you, if you analyze the data from the past, you can kind of get a sense of some certain things may happen uh, in, in, in which direction in the future. That's right. Yeah. But you can also uh, not only uh, uh, predict the future, you can protect yourself against certain things in the future. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've had a little issue in the United States around, uh, uh, around the use of data uh -huh. for political purposes. Cambridge Analytica, mm -hmm. Facebook. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Recently, yeah. Uh, Facebook so had a crisis. So if you take our course, uh, you'll be able to understand how those algorithms and mm -hmm. how that data was used in ways that possibly were not great for our political system. I see. Well, thank you so much for, for doing such a meaningful thing, a beneficial thing for well, students. Yeah. It's been, it's, been, uh, it's been really gratifying work. I can yeah. And also you are really uh, actively involved in the you know, international collaboration um, on global education because you ha had this kind of collaboration with Tsinghua and also you mentioned the institute from in, in Shenzhen. So in your opinion, what do you think is the definition of global education? And why is, um, you think it's really right. need needed and necessary right at, right at the moment? Well, you know, I think global education means several different things. I mean, first, mm -hmm. uh, I think a well-educated person has uh, some understanding of the world uh, mm -hmm. outside of where they live. So uh, in the first instance, a global education is about uh, ensuring that all students mm -hmm. uh, get some serious exposure to understanding the history and culture and literature mm -hmm. uh, and culture uh, uh, in a, a broad sense as well of how people live and think and uh, work in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that you get it uh, uh, across the world, so uh, f so that you have a, a, a sense that there may be people living in different nations, different politics, uh, different ideologies, uh, different uh, tastes, different consumer preferences, whatever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they might be. But uh, uh, but first of all, uh, those differences are uh, all part of a global conversation about these things, and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and there, there are similarities as well as differences. Uh, mm -hmm. And the differences are not uh, threatening differences. They're differences that make the world a more interesting place. Yeah, yeah. So in the first instance, global education is an education about the globe. Mm -hmm. but it helps you to see the globe better. It helps you to see the globe. And of course, you know, we know that today uh, events around the globe are going to shape our lives in ways that we can't always see, but we know it's going to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. There may be a speech given by the president of China Mm -hmm. uh, and it will have an immediate effect on stock market prices in New York. And in fact, that happened just yeah, it last week, right? So yes, yes, we know that happens. Yeah, this happens over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we think this is important for, uh, uh, you know, for our understanding of, uh, of the world. We think it's important for geopolitical harmony across mm -hmm. the world. Uh, and it's also important for people who want to go into business. Uh, they're going to have to know what people might be interested in uh, in buying, what they might need uh, in terms of technology, what they might uh, uh, be interested in uh, either participating in or taking advantage of in a global marketplace, because all marketplaces now are global. Yeah, they're all interconnected. They're all interconnected. And you know, whether you look at supply chains or whether you look at, uh, at markets, uh, mm -hmm. these are global phenomena. Mm -hmm. By the same token, almost every single challenge that we confront uh, is a global challenge. Climate change, mm -hmm. you can't address it by just dealing with it in one place. You have to deal with it as a, as a global phenomenon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, disease, uh, almost all epidemics now are global diseases. Uh, they may, uh, diseases may begin in South America or Africa or yeah, it was uh, Southeast Asia or wherever, but from they one continent to another continent. Yeah, from so one country to another country. Yeah. And now, of course, people are traveling, and mm -hmm. uh, germs are traveling. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, as fast as we are, if not faster. Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to understand that uh, there are global dimensions, virtually to everything mm -hmm. that we might study in the university. Oh, but that's that's yeah. only one side of a global education. What's the other side? I think side? the other side is 
that it's important for us to, uh, to develop new kinds of programs and new kinds of curricula, uh, and even new kinds of schools and, and, and colleges that, uh, that will, uh, um, will work across global uh, and national uh, borders mm -hmm. to devise uh, a, more, um, a more global understanding of the world uh, for everyone, mm -hmm. uh, but entail uh, uh, people sitting down and making choices about you know, how you teach this, how you uh, prepare uh, students for going to college, how you think about uh, what the value of a college degree is and how mm -hmm. you should direct uh, uh, the curriculum in that, in that instance, how you mm -hmm. train for advanced uh, 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 scientific research or how you train in the professions. Yeah. Because, because you know, people are moving around uh, themselves and if they uh, want to have careers or if they want to uh, go to college in a different country, or if they want potentially to work for a uh, firm that is going to be working in a, in a, in a global marketplace. Mm -hmm. It would be good if everyone had some kind of common understanding of mm -hmm. uh, not just understanding of others, but also a, a common understanding that could be devised through, uh, through, through schools and, and colleges working more together. Mm -hmm. So I tried to work on that. Uh, when I was at Columbia, we set up global centers around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked on that as chancellor at Berkeley, set up the Joint Institute at, uh, at Shenzhen, which uh, yeah. is devising its curriculum with faculty from, Sh from Tsinghua and faculty from Berkeley working together. International faculties. They're international, and they're, they're not bringing their, their, their curriculum from either Beijing or Berkeley and saying, this is the only way to do it. They're changing. Oh, they're changing. They're changing. So they and design their own international they're curriculum. Th yeah. So uh, it's not just the Department of X and the Department of Y. It's actually uh, joint kinds of uh, projects that, that, that go across disciplines. And we know now that so much of the most uh, innovative and mm -hmm. important work is actually cross-disciplinary or interdisciplinary. I see. Anything particular you think that's really inno innovative? Uh, regarding design well, I mean, for example, if yeah. you are uh, thinking about um, uh, another area that is uh, being moved into in Shenzhen is uh, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, machine learning, mm -hmm. automation, AI. Uh, well, there, uh, you know, there are many questions that get raised uh, mm -hmm. by AI. A lot. Uh, yeah. For example, take the car uh, accident, the fatality that happened in uh -huh. Arizona with the Uber uh, automated the vehicle. Yeah. The tragedy. So they're trying to figure out who's responsible for this. Now that's a question uh, for uh, the insurance companies. They mm -hmm. want to know who would be liable. Yeah. That's a question for the law. I mean, who would be potentially criminal, criminally culpable? Is it the uh, driver? Mm -hmm. Is it the, um, the sensor in the car? Is it the person who coded the car? Is it the person who owns the company? Uh, well, yeah, that's you know, these are big arguable. questions. Yeah. yeah, you could argue, but you will argue these <laughs> things. We know these are all questions that will be argued. Yes. So uh, in order to solve some of these puzzles, you have to have engineers. Mm -hmm. You have to have people who know something about transportation. Mm -hmm. You have to have uh, people who know something about the law. Yeah. You also have to think uh, about somebody who knows about the ethics of these things and not just uh, some yeah. of the philosophical issues. Yes. Well, this is an interdisciplinary kind of uh, enterprise. Yes. And we have to make sure that our educational and research institutions are ready to enter into this new different world that we're mm -hmm. already beginning to uh, live in. Yeah, yeah. So in thinking about global education, mm -hmm. uh, I'm also working now with a new effort to build a global school network around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and What's so it called? it's called the Whittle Schools and Studios. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, uh, it's an extraordinarily innovative uh, uh, idea to not just set up a school that is an international school, but to set up a school that's a global school and to set it up uh, in different places around the world, but in which no school is the mothership, no school is the hub. It's like the main building, no, no such thing. They're all uh, uh, different schools that are connected to each other and that are trying to devise uh, new ways to educate our young people. Oh, okay, that's, so the that's first something new. So yeah. a, a year from now, uh, uh, Whittle Schools will open two new schools, the first of Where the two schools, one in Washington, D.C., and one in Shenzhen. Oh, okay. Okay, so there's a Shenzhen connection again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's very exciting. Uh, because uh, we are pooling ideas, uh, educational resources, talent, uh, hiring people uh, from all over the world.
Mm -hmm. And there are people who've been leaders in education in China. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who've been leaders in education in the UK. Uh, people have been leaders in education in the U.S. Oh, uh, okay. For example, uh, one of the people I uh, am working with is the former president of Yale University. Oh, okay. Another person I'm wow. working with is the current head, although he is going to be uh, moving to work for Whittle Schools, uh, the current head of Harrow School in the U.K. I see. So all those and and again, another, another person we're working with is a is 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 a former principal from Randolph Ujian here in Beijing. Oh, okay. Those were all the um, prestigious, you, yeah, They're universities all very and schools, very yeah, schools from, from and around yeah, the world. So yeah. all those, I mean, I mean, like their experiences, valuable experiences, strategies, they will be combined and applied in this whistle Whittle school Whittle and schools. the studios, right? Well, the studios Why are an studios expansion again? of the school, and uh -huh. they will be academic programs that will be available not only to the students in the schools, but to the students who live in the in the city where the school will be. So I see. Uh, there'll be even more courses, even more opportunities, even more outreach. Uh -huh. And um, all the courses will be taught in English. Well, or there, or there will be both courses in in English and in Chinese, and possibly in other languages. Uh -huh. In Washington, uh, we'll have students even from the age of three. Doing, oh, okay. doing Chinese immersion. Age three, that's like start preschool. Start when they'll start in preschool. The kindergarten. <laughs> and they'll start, they'll start uh, uh, learning Chinese. Oh, okay. And so some courses will be taught in Chinese, some will be taught in English, some may be taught in Spanish. Mm. But we'll have a Multi real focus on, on, on multiple languages. languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's also a sense of global education. Exactly. You've got, you got to speak more than one language. Precisely. Yeah. Oh, good, good. So so as um, another question, because sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in the educational field. I may ask questions from an amateur's point of view. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> and uh, you know, the many international schools right now in China and uh, you know, in, in the whole world, uh, as an expert like you, if you go to a certain international school, what criteria do you often use to, you know, to help you decide whether the education system or the education quality there is good or not so good? Yeah, well, there are many, many different efforts to try to figure out how to best assess uh, student yeah, progress yeah. in how schools. How do you do the assessments? You know, there are tests, and there are ways to think about testing, and there are tests that are about uh, achievement in particular fields, and tests that are more about aptitude and, uh, uh, and, and intellectual, uh, you know, capability. Yeah. But uh, uh, many schools are, uh, uh, continue to be evaluated in terms of what do the students do after they graduate. Mm -hmm. Do they go to a college? Do they, do they go to a top college? Or do they go on to careers that are important in the world? And uh, do they make a difference? And uh, yeah. I would like to think that we also uh, measure uh, student happiness and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, one of the tasks of education is to equip young people with the resources they need to live a full life, mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. realize their, uh, dreams. You know, their dreams, but also uh, you know, to, to have uh, you know, self-understanding. Mm. that comes from uh, a really fine educational background. Yeah. Uh, and equipping them, not only with skills, but with the capacity to learn. We know uh, in our society today, we're gonna have to keep learning. Yeah. Knowledge is changing so quickly. Lifelong learning. You got it, <laughs> exactly so. Yeah. But that's, uh, uh, to, d to do that effectively, mm -hmm. you have to learn how to learn. I see, I see. And one of the things that schools need to do is to precisely teach those kinds of skills. They're not directly, you know, how to be a coder or how to be a, a business person. Mm -hmm. but they're also how to be able to, uh, uh, to learn, to take advantage keep of learning. other things, to keep uh, yourself uh, uh, at the top of your, uh, of your profession, but also to be a leader. Mm -hmm. It's one yeah. of the things that I'm thinking about here at the Schwartzman, how to be a yeah. leader for these uh, incredibly talented scholars who are here. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's it, to me, uh, uh, what schools and colleges uh, need to try to do is to always evaluate uh, what they're doing in terms of, are they really preparing people to uh, live fulfilled lives, yeah. uh, to live lives where they can continue to learn, and to live lives where they can take leadership uh, roles in uh, whatever profession or walk of life they might Enter. Yeah, so you focus more on what kind of person a student will become after they graduate. Well, yeah. indeed. So it's not always easy to measure these things. Yeah, that's why we need experts like you well, to help uh, us, to help the students we need to, to achieve the goal. We need to keep working on trying to do a better job because uh, uh, the investments we make in education are critical for people for across their entire lives. Yeah, yeah. 
And I think, I think the other thing to say is that uh, 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 you asked about international schools in China, and there are, of course, many international schools, probably more and more all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is not so much an international school. Oh? Um, well, it's why, not because so? it's not taking a curriculum that simply uh, is developed uh, in a school in the UK and saying we're going to offer that here, we're going to offer A levels here, or we're going to offer IB here. Uh, we're actually developing a global curriculum. So uh, I think I think what uh, what I well, the reason I find this so fascinating is because if you begin by establishing a global school, which is a different thing than an international school. Mm -hmm. uh, you might also find ways to build uh, global colleges or universities mm -hmm. or companies yep. and, uh, and create thereby the, the basis on which one can imagine uh, very different forms of cooperation and collaboration across, uh, across national and cultural boundaries. I see. So that's why you think certain international schools are not really international because they don't have this kind of global sense. International means taking one thing from one place and moving it to another place. <laughs> global means uh, creating something that is genuinely local and global at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So that makes it well different from other international schools, right? That's the effort uh, to, to create that kind of difference. But uh, when we open the school, you'll have to come and yeah, and definitely. I'd, lo I'd love to. And also, I'm sure the viewers will be also quite interested in how we can, you know, get in touch with uh, with with, the, with Will and how they can the students or well, the, or the kids can get admitted to to Will. Well, we'd love to uh, 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 let them know. And of course, uh, we're not only opening schools in uh, in Shenzhen, but we're working now on uh, on new schools both in Nanjing and in Hangzhou. Uh -huh. And eventually, uh, we will be opening schools in other parts of China as well. So. In, including here, so it's uh, uh, it's something we would love to uh, uh, to talk to any viewers about. Uh, get in touch with us, please. Before we finish up here, any other words you may want to say to our Chinese audience? Uh, this is a very exciting time in China. Every time I come here, I see things that uh, suggest that uh, life is moving faster here. I think than just about any other part of the world. Uh, I started coming to Beijing in 2004, and I saw all the building around first the Olympics, and uh, uh, and uh, now I see uh, uh, even uh, 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 bluer skies than I uh, had seen before, and I'm very pleased with that. But I have had uh, uh, really special opportunities here at Tsinghua, which is a great university, and. Uh, and I've uh, been impressed by the commitment on the part of the university here uh, to genuinely uh, work uh, together with institutions from outside China to try to build a, uh, a more powerful uh, uh, global understanding of how we can best build and, uh, and, and develop universities. So it's been wonderful to be, as a chancellor at Berkeley, uh, involved in a collaboration. It's wonderful now to be here in the Schwarzman. Uh, college and to be able to work with uh, Tsinghua faculty and these incredible students recruited from both China and across the world. Uh, and to know that, uh, that China is really open to the world, uh, uh, not closing down as so many other countries uh, in the world are doing right now, but really opening itself up to, uh, uh, to, to, to all kinds of people, uh, all kinds of ideas all kinds of institutions and proposals for new institutions and uh, I look forward to many uh, subsequent trips to China where I can work uh, with fellow educators here to try to make sure uh, we benefit from, uh, from all the opportunities that exist here in this, uh, in this great nation. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. See you guys next time. Bye-bye.